Tonight we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 13. This is a story that I have not studied much before this week, and uh, one that perhaps you have not studied much either, but it's still in the Bible. These strange stories are in the Bible for a reason. We need to listen to what God has to say to us. We need to see what the Bible is revealing to us. Before I read, I'm just going to mention a few things just as some background here. So the situation, King David and King Solomon have died, and now that they have died, King Solomon has a son named Rehoboam, and Solomon's son is a foolish leader. He takes some bad advice given to him from some peers of his, and he is really hard on the ten northern tribes of Israel, so these ten northern tribes break away from Jerusalem, and they set up their own king, so we have basically two peoples of Israel right now. The northern king's name is Jeroboam. He doesn't want the people of the north to be going down to Jerusalem for their worship at the temple. So he sets up his own sort of worship. He sets up actually two golden calves for northerners to worship. One is in Bethel, the other one is in Dan, which is quite far to the north. Bethel is actually pretty close to the border of Judah. And so that's where the story picks up here. First Corinthians, or excuse me, First Kings chapter 13. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down. And the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh yourself. And I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way that you came. So we went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And they also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? And his sons showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you 
or go in with you, neither will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, A lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown into the road. And the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, spoke to him. And he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And he went and found his body thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones." For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria Samaria, shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. So this is a bizarre story. I'm just going to kind of go through it a little bit and call your attention to a few things here. In verses 1 and 2, there's an unnamed man of God who crosses the border and condemns the false worship that's going on there. He crosses from Judah into the northern tribes of Israel and he points at not the king, but the altar. He points at the altar and condemns the altar, which is kind of interesting. And he also prophesies of a coming King Josiah who would desecrate that altar. And that would be fulfilled maybe about 300 some years later when King Josiah would do exactly as prophesied there. That altar would be torn down and the ashes would be poured out. So then in verses 4 and 5, the king who doesn't like what he's hearing because he's trying to basically start or inaugurate this new place of worship so people don't go to the south and that other country to worship, he stretches out his hand and says, seize him, and uh, his arm dries up like a tree, and then the altar, as prophesied, it breaks, and the ashes that are on it are all poured out. And uh, interestingly enough, the king doesn't repent. He doesn't 
think, oh, maybe, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I should listen to what this guy said since everything that he said comes true and my arm just dries up like that when I said to seize him. He doesn't repent. He just wants to be healed. He doesn't really care about God or worshiping God. He cares about his body, and that's it. Verse 7, after he is healed, the king invites the man for a meal, and it says a reward. A reward. The king actually wants to gain this man of God's loyalty. If this guy has some magical powers of some kind, because Jeroboam doesn't seem to believe, but apparently has some sort of powers, maybe if I can get this guy on my side and we can eat together, maybe I can use him as a force for my good instead. Eating meals together back then was not the way it is today. You know, we can eat with all different kinds of people and it doesn't signify anything. But back then, eating an official meal together was a bond of friendship. And so the king is thinking, if I can get this guy in to eat a meal with me, then that kind of like seals a relationship here. So, this man of God rejects that hospitality, which is quite actually a hostile gesture, but he does it for good reason. The man of God refuses following God's explicit instructions. And these explicit instructions are repeated twice in this chapter. God says you are not to eat bread or drink water in this land where you are going, and you are not to go or return, rather, by the way you came. And that's not an arbitrary command. Not eating is kind of like implying the the, uh, urgency of the matter. So don't even stop to eat. Deliver your message and get home. And don't go back the way you came is a way of signifying not to travel as everybody else travels. So he's going into a place where people are worshiping falsely, he's not to travel as everyone else travels. It's kind of a way that is signifying to a prophet. So, God has given them explicit instructions, and he obeys those instructions. He says no to the king. Prophets are not to be bought or owned. The king tries to buy the prophet with a meal and with a reward, maybe a bribe of some kind. But prophets are not to be bought or owned. And that's why he refuses. That's part of the reason for God's instructions. So, for example, this is kind of part of the reason why in the Christian Reformed Church, ministers are neither hired nor fired. I cannot, I am not hired into this church. I am called to this church. I am not, I cannot be fired from this church. I might be deposed or there might be a separation, but I can't be hired and fired. That's not how it works. I work for God. I don't work for you. I am here to serve you, but I work for God. And so there's a reason why we have things arranged as we do. So there's no, no way that anybody can come and say to me, for example, preach what we want or you're fired. I'm here to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. If I'm not preaching the truth anymore, then there are other ways for accountability to be said, okay, Pastor Aaron, you're not preaching the truth anymore. And then there's other avenues for me to be deposed or whatever. But pastors are not hired or fired. Prophets are not bought or owned. Verses 11 through 14, then there's this unnamed old prophet who goes to this man of God. He says, saddle the donkey, I want to see this guy. 
At first, this old prophet seems like he's a good guy seeking out God's truth. It seems like, hey, here's somebody who's preaching the truth and there's even some signs to go along with it. I want to meet this guy. I want to hear what he has to say. But then, in verses 18 and 19, the old prophet lies to get the man of God to eat a meal. The man of God explains to him, like he explained to the king, I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to follow God's instructions here. But this old prophet lies to him to get him to come back and eat. Now, it doesn't really say what this old prophet's motivation is or what's going through his mind. We don't really know. There's, we, can, we can guess. Um, maybe he's just eager to, to be of service to him. Maybe that's assuming the best of him. Maybe he just really wants to show this guy hospitality and he's just doing what he can to get him back to his house so he can show that hospitality. But we are not to... Just to take a lesson from this, we are not to believe everyone who says they have a word from the Lord. Just because somebody says that doesn't mean that we have to take everything at face value. And similarly, just because someone is a pastor, for example, doesn't mean everything that they say is verbatim from God's mouth. Every person, even the best of us, We have ulterior motives, we have some agendas, and we have some biases. So, we need to test everything, even words from an angel from heaven, as this this old prophet says, an angel told me to tell you this. So, it's like in Galatians 1, it says, even if we, even if we apostles, Or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Even an angel from heaven, we have to test everything. 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So, just something to reinforce for you. It's important that you know what God says in here. Because if you're not really acquainted with it, somebody can take it and twist it to suit their own ideas or agendas. And so we need to know the whole counsel of God so that if a pastor or even an angel from heaven should appear to us, and tell us something different, we can recognize it for what it is. Verses 20 through 22. God condemns the man of God through the lying prophet. This is kind of a strange turn of events. The prophet lies to the man of God, and then God speaks to this man of God, or condemns him, through this lying prophet. Now, it's not the first time that somebody who's in error has been used by God to speak. I mean, God speaks through the false prophet Balaam through those things. Balaam wants to curse Israel, but he ends up blessing them. God speaks through him. King Saul prophesies also. But you can imagine being this man of God here. This guy comes to you and says, an angel told me to come and take you back to my house and feed you, give you a meal. Oh, okay, sure. And you go to this guy's, this prophet's house, and you're, you're eating and drinking, and then suddenly this same guy who invited you here stands up and says, thus says the Lord, because you disobeyed me and you ate and drank, you are not going to be buried with your fathers anymore. Okay, I kind of wish that they would have told us how that played out. Because at first the prophet says, hey, come on with me, an angel told me, and now he's saying God has now told me that you are condemned. So 
Who knows how that man of God responded at that moment. It might have been something like, well, you told me an angel spoke to you and now you're condemning me for doing what you said? I mean, you've got to be lying somewhere. Anyways. Burial. Just one, one quick point about that. A proper burial was commonly thought, commonly thought to ensure well-being in the afterlife. So if you have a proper burial then you'll be sent off well. So that's part of why that was a punishment. But it's also an honor to be buried with your own family and with your people in your land. And so that was something, especially back then, that everybody wanted. Verse 24, the man of God was killed by a lion on the way home. So right away, this condemnation from this prophet to this man of God is fulfilled. It's taken place. And then in verse 27, there's some words that are repeated. Whenever the Bible repeats things, that's time for us to take notice. There again, that man says, that prophet says, saddle the donkey. So he's starting up again. Verse 28 the lion behaved strangely, not very becoming of lions normally, and that kind of indicates that this lion was acting on God's behalf. It kind of, the way it describes it here, the lion attacks this man of God and throws him down on the road, and then he just stands there. He doesn't eat the body, and not only that, but he doesn't go after the donkey either. So you can just imagine going by on this road and here's this guy dead from the lion and the lion's just standing there. And the donkey's standing right there too. They're just kind of hanging out. Kind of must have been quite a striking sight. It's not really something yet you see. So then the old prophet buries the man of God in his own tomb and wants to be buried beside him. This prophet seems to, seems to shift a little bit. He recognizes that what this guy has said is actually true and real. So, burying him in his own tomb and then also wanting to be buried with him is kind of a way of saying, um, I identify with this person and this person is... Kind of like family to me. You notice that he called him my brother. Alas, my brother. So this guy is my family now. And it's a way to honor this man too. So in verse 32 there, towards the end, this old prophet recognizes the truth of God spoken through this man of God. And... Uh, our kind of takeaway from that is that God's truth stands even when it's spoken by imperfect lips. This man of God didn't obey God, but he did still speak the truth of God. So God is still true even if every last one of us is a liar. So all prophets of old and all preachers of late, all are sinful and biased, myself included. But that doesn't change the truth of God. Even when somebody is sinful and imperfect, they can still speak God's truth. And that doesn't change. We need to be able to discern what is true and what is not from what people say or write. But God's truth stands no matter who speaks it. So the prophet learns, but the king learns nothing. This old prophet who lied, he seems to, he seems to undergo, undergo a change. But the king, he learns nothing. In the epilogue there, in those last two verses, it says he just kind of continued with his... False worship, worshiping those golden calves. 
So this is kind of a weird story because it seems like the least of the sins here is punished and the greater sins are left unpunished. You have this man of God who's punished with death by a lion for not keeping to a T what God has said to him, just eating and drinking water. There's worse things in the world. But then there's the idolatrous Jeroboam, the king, who's worshiping golden calves on another altar. And then there's this lying prophet who says, an angel told me to take you home and feed you. Seems like those two people should have been punished first, or worst, but those people seem to get let off the hook, at least for the time being. But while some sins are more destructive than others, or bigger, as it were, all sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of bigger sins are death than littler sins are not so much. It just says the wages of sin is death. So whether we sin big or we sin small, the result is the same. And so even though though the the smaller sin, if, if you will, was the one that was punished, it still has the same result. Like the old prophet, we might have good intentions in our lives, but we still cause destruction. This is kind of a a human thing. We want to be helpful. We want to be good to people. And sometimes when we want to be helpful, we end up just hurting people. We end, end up creating dependence instead of independence. If there's somebody who's poor and we just throw money at them, for example, and they continue to go to the bottle, for example, we're not actually helping them. We're enabling them. And instead of teaching them how to become self-sufficient to take care of themselves, we're just teaching them that, oh, I'm going to just get all kinds of money on a regular basis for free. So that old prophet, he might have had some good intentions. He may have, maybe not, but let's just assume the best of him. Let's say that he was just wanting to show hospitality. He may have had good intentions, but he ended up causing this man of God to stumble. And it killed him. In many ways, not every way, but in many ways, that man of God, he foreshadows Christ. Like the man of God, Christ crossed the border. He crossed the border of heaven and earth. Like the man of God, Christ condemned our sin. He told us essentially that we were sinners in need of him as a savior. The man of God, like Christ, was confirmed by signs. It says in Acts 2, where Peter is preaching to everyone, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So Jesus was proven to be from God by signs and wonders, just like this man of God. I wish we would have known his name, but we don't know his name. The death of that man of God made a change in the old prophet. Kind of reminds me of when Jesus died and there was that centurion who was there helping to crucify him who says, truly this man was the Son of God. It was Christ's death that made us right with God too. Romans 5.10 For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. How much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life? So just as that man of God brought a change in that prophet, the death of Christ has made us right with God and made a change with us too. 
that old prophet, he asked to be buried with that man of God. Make sure that when I die that my bones go with his bones in the tomb there. In the similar way, we are buried with Christ, it says. Romans 6, 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So just as he wanted to be buried with that man of God, we are buried with Christ too. The old prophet said, Alas, my brother, we are Christ's brothers too. It says in Hebrews, He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. So Jesus calls us brothers. There's one major contrast, one major difference between this man of God and Christ. The man of God died for his sin, but Christ died for our sin. There's one major difference there. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. But both deaths brought people to the Lord. I didn't put that on the screen, but that might be worth writing down. Both deaths brought people to to the Lord. So just as Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Fruit was born by both of these deaths. So like the man of God, we will die one day. We are sinners like he was. But like the Son of Man, we will rise again and have eternal life with him. Both deaths brought people to the Lord and into the Lord's truth. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord our God, it's a strange way to to save the world, sending your son to, to die on the cross. There's some strange stories that foreshadow him too and point ahead to him. Remind us, Lord, that we are saved by your grace, not our works. That even though we are sinners, Lord, we need to recognize your truth and embrace you and put our full trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.